Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Military Monday Show with Mike Guardia, award-winning author and historian. Hey everybody, super excited today because Mike Guardia, as you know, comes on these shows every first Monday for our, our Military Monday Show, but his new book is about to hit the bookshelves. It is called Fire in the Hole, Tales of Combat with the 1st Engineer Battalion in Vietnam. And you can pre-order it on Kindle uh, by December 7th and by 15th, the Kindle version. And it will be out. So perfect timing for uh, friendly gifts uh, if you're into military history, especially Vietnam. Uh, this will definitely be a book for you and because it shines light on uh, people that served in Vietnam, and sometimes we forget about combat engineers. So, well, Mike, how are you? Hey, Lisa, I'm doing great. Always a pleasure to be on the show. Hey, glad to have you here. Excited about your book. I know we've touched on this on, you know, every show the last few months, just going, okay, is it coming out yet? Is it out yet? Um, and there's so much that goes into a book, right? And this is definitely one, um, you know, telling these stories, and you talk about in the book, um, how important is that we do not forget those who served in Vietnam, just like we, um, you know, don't forget those in World War II. But um, sometimes the those who have served in Vietnam um, are kind of overshadowed, right, and kind of not put in the spotlight as much as, as we should be putting them in the spotlight and honoring them. Right. And that was one of the things that r really motivated me to take this project on was that, uh, you know, it's been an unfortunate circumstance of history that our Vietnam veterans have not gotten the recognition that they deserve. And it seems that the only recognition they get in a broader sense is the controversy that was attached to the war that they were a part of. You know, it's uh, it's no it's. No undisputed fact that a lot of those veterans came home to a society that castigated them and that they were treated horribly, that many of them were denied entry into their local veterans organizations. And, uh, wow. you know, they, they were met with, you know, on one end, it was hostility. And I think at best, it was m mostly indifference. And, you know, if you, uh, if you take that and compare it against, you know, the hero's welcome that much of the World War II generation got when they came home, you know, it's sad because, you know, if you look at the war from beginning to end, you know, you uh, had what can only be said as the best and brightest of America fighting on the front lines in that war. There's been a uh, there's been a trend uh, amongst many popular historians over the over the over the better part of 50 years to say that it was a poor man's war and that, you know, we were just taking draftees who were more or less the dregs of society and throwing them onto the front lines in a war that we knew was unwinnable. And, uh, you know, well, you did have a few questionable draftees in there and you did have, uh, you did have a breakdown in discipline towards the end of the conflict. You know, it ignores the broader picture that the U.S. military really carried itself with distinction. And, uh, when you look at how many of these veterans were portrayed by the media in, all of the years that followed, you know, just reinforced a lot of the negative stereotypes and the Vietnam vets were, you know, pretty much the, uh, pretty much a silent generation under themselves because of a lot of the hostility that they faced. And one of the things that I noticed, uh, particularly throughout Hollywood and you, you know, I have said this in other programs before that, you know, when you take a look at, uh, how Hollywood has portrayed the normal Vietnam veteran, it's always been somebody who they've portrayed as a misfit in modern mm -hmm. society. You know, if you take a look at all the popular films like Apocalypse Now and Platoon and Full Metal Jacket, you don't really see a uh, positive portrayal of the war in Vietnam or even the veterans who fought in it. And I think to myself, even if you take some of the uh, action heroes of the time, you know, if you take guys like John Rambo and, and, uh, and Billy Jack and James Braddock, you know, even though they were heroes of the stories that they were in, they were still portrayed as anti-heroes almost. You know, they were these troubled souls who uh, were constantly struggling with the, the, their memories of Vietnam. And uh, they themselves served as a case study of, you know, just how bad the veterans had it. It wasn't really until uh, that Mel Gibson movie, uh, Where We Were Soldiers, came out that uh, you really had a reversal of fortunes for the Vietnam vets community. And, uh, you know, we really need to give them 
their due because they're starting to die off at uh, rates comparable to what the World War II generation is. Mm, and it's kind of come full circle for you with your books, you know, um, writing about Hal Moore and, you know, now getting back into the Vietnam War history. Uh, Do you think people, you know, because of the Korean War, that at the beginning of Vietnam, everybody thought it was, you know, I wonder how many people, you know, a lot of people forget the Korean War too, right? We've talked about right. that before. But yeah. the beginning of Vietnam that people thought, okay, it's it's like the Korean War again. But at the same time, you know, soldiers were drafted. So right. to come home after being drafted and some went in wanting to go in and wanting to serve. And some were drafted and wanted to. Some were as scared as could be. And some, you know, look at the, at the, at the TV show MASH. You know, they're like, hey, you know, I'm going to do whatever I can to go home. Um, even the Korean War too, right? And so when, when you look at it, um, and the war did change, it's not the, what, you can't really look at the soldiers and blame them for stuff. I mean, they were also kind of thrust into a war that I don't think they were prepared for, quite frankly. Or, am I right or wrong on that? I'm not the historian. You are. <laughs> well, you know, they were thrust into a war that, uh, that I think was poorly conceived and poorly managed at the strategic level. And you really had a situation that was untenable from the get go that, you know, even though our soldiers were performing brilliantly throughout every one of the ground campaigns that they were in, you know, you uh, had unclear parameters and you had a uh, very, very, very solid disconnect between the soldiers who were fighting on the front lines and the war managers from uh, their strategic perches, both in country and in DC. And really what it made for was a situation where you were putting the, you were putting the best equipment and the best soldiers in the field, but you were putting them in a situation where, you know, they could win a battle and they could secure a particular area. But then as soon as they moved out of that area and were going to hand it off to the uh, South Vietnamese, uh, the, uh, the, that South Vietnam military apparatus wasn't strong enough to, uh, keep hold of the region and to, and to keep it secure under their own power. You know, to say nothing of the fact that, uh, the enemy was able to have several cross border sanctuaries in Laos and Cambodia. And, uh, mm-hmm. neither of those countries were, or, uh, anywhere near having the wherewithal to, you know, keep the communist influence out. So let's, let's talk about in your book, you talk about combat engineers, which is, I mean, how often do we hear about combat, combat engineers? Really? Right. Like, always <laughs> talk about pilots. We're talking about, you know, uh, you know, tank warfare where, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. um, well, we've talked about everything all the way to George Washington. You know, it's like we've talked a little bit about everything on this show, but with your books, um, combat engineers, I think this is something that, you know, us on the civilian side or those who are not as familiar in military history will actually know what combat engineers do. Right. And that was another thing that motivated me to take on this project because, you know, I look at, uh, all of the popular military history titles and they all tend to fall into one of a few categories they're either biographies or they're uh you know or they're or they're overviews of a particular battle or you know they're looking at a particular unit history or it's about pilots it's about tanks it's about the uh you know it's about the paratroopers it's about uh you know it's about the foot soldiers on the ground and comparatively little attention i think has ever been given to what the combat engineers do and the and the vital role that they play throughout all of our battlefield operations. So for anyone out there who's listening, who's uh, unfamiliar with the combat engineers, uh, they are multifaceted troops who do a lot of different missions on the battlefield. They can fight as infantry whenever they're ordered to. Uh, they set in clear minefields. They also build tactical bridges. Uh, they, uh, they also, um, they also do a lot of route security. They blow mines in place. They are, they, uh, or they were, um, uh, up until recent years, they were responsible for the removal of unexploded enemy ordnance. Um, they, uh, they also set obstacles. And, uh, they also clear spaces for, uh, for tactical roads and they also clear landing zones. And it's, uh, it's, 
it's a very uh it's a very technical job that i think after having researched it and after having interviewed a, a, a number of combat engineering veterans that it's a uh it's a job that requires a lot of resilience and a lot of technical skills because aside from everything that i've just described they also uh they also are responsible for vertical construction which means that a lot of the base camps that get uh built by us forces whenever we deploy to any parts of the world you have the combat engineers who are building those bases from the ground up they're the ones who are laying the foundations for the barracks they're 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 building the uh they're building the command centers and wherever we deploy if the infrastructure isn't uh isn't strong enough to support any one of our maneuver forces you have the combat engineers who are doing a lot of infrastructure and road repair making sure that the roads can accommodate any uh any tonnage of vehicular traffic and making sure the bridges are you know of an of a uh, sturdy sturdy enough quality to handle uh handle traffic over over various uh over various seasons that's insane when you think about it because yeah. um they're pretty much like the surveyors of the land right so they go right. out and they're on their own right they're out there on their own like they you're you're doing something so important and you are like you're saying laying the foundation but don't you have to be like super stealth because you don't have anything supporting you in a way right when you yeah, go well, out. well it, it's very hard to be stealth when you're doing any number of these construction projects and uh that's why um whenever you have an engineering construction team who is out in the middle of nowhere and they're trying to build a bridge or they're, uh, or they're, they're, they're trying to resurface a road or even if they're clearing mines, uh, you typically have an engineer or excuse me, you uh, typically have an in- an infantry security company that goes along with them. It can be, uh, it, it can be, uh, any type of infantry element that, uh, you know, just provides the overwatching security. So that in case the engineers get attacked, um, there's a, uh, there's a rapid response force that can at least keep the enemy held in one place while the engineers themselves can stop whatever they're doing and pick up their own rifles and, uh, and, and return fire. And that's wow. part of, so, uh, this, yeah. yeah, that, yeah, that's part of what makes the engineers so flexible is that they have the capacity to fight as infantry on order. So they, okay. So they can do that and then. At the same time, when you think about these engineers going out, how many would be in like, it would be like a, a battalion. Like you talk about, um, there was Operation Amarillo. Um, we're not talking about Amarillo, Texas, right? yeah. <laughs> You know, this is not Texas, y'all. Um, mm-hmm. but when, um, when they go out to really, you know, put the foundation together, how many of them go out at one time or does that depend on, what's going on in the specific battle zone that's that's about to happen and doesn't it have to be faster than you know depending on what's going on like because things happen quickly you, you don't always know what the enemy's doing right mm-hmm. so um don't things move and change all the time even though if you're building something it could be like all right forget it we're going here instead and you have to move it right well, that's why, um, whenever any one of these engineering units go out, or in the case of a battalion, you usually have different companies within the battalion that are assigned to a specific sector. And it's, uh, it's that company that's in charge of that particular part of the operational environment. And you'll never, or, well, I won't say never, but rarely will you see an entire engineer battalion as a battalion in one singular place. Normally the companies are farmed out to different areas. And, uh, you know, if one company gets called away for it, any number of reasons, you can have another, um, engineering asset cover down on them. And a lot of times what will happen, and this even happened in one instance in the book where, you know, you had an engineering team who was working on a construction project. You know, they were working on, uh, working on some, uh, some road repairs. And their infantry security element got called away because there was a firefight that was happening uh, a few kilometers away. And really, that's the nature of the business. You you kind of have to expect it because in that particular environment, you know, the infantry is always the priority. So if the engineers are there, you'll put them in one of two situations where they have to uh, provide their own security and they just rotate soldiers um, on and off the line. The project takes a lot uh, a lot longer to get done. 
or you have some other allied unit that's nearby try to fill in for them. And interestingly enough, that's a good segue into uh, one of the more interesting anecdotes mm-hmm. of the book where uh, Charlie Company or one of their um, road reconstruction teams was working on a project. Uh, their infantry element got called away and the infantry unit that replaced the outgoing one was an Australian infantry unit of all things. Hmm. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I think a lot of uh, people tend to forget that the war in Vietnam was not just solely an American yeah. endeavor. We had a lot of allied uh, partners who were, uh, you know, who were involved in that conflict and uh, the Australians were among them and uh, they had a, they had a great reputation among a lot of the allied combatants. They, um, they said that, uh, they said that they were, they said that they were tough as nails and uh, on par with our own special forces. So just try to imagine Crocodile Dundee as a, uh, <laughs> as a soldier in Vietnam. And that'll give you, I think, a pretty realistic idea of, of the caliber of the Australian soldiers that were out there. Wow. And, you know, they know the terrain too. I mean, yeah, Austra- I, uh, Australians are crazy, man. I mean that in a positive way. They are like in a really positive way. I wouldn't mess with them. Yeah. You know what I mean? I wouldn't. I I just you know I have a lot of friends in Australian, and it's like, oh yeah, we're if we're gonna go for it, we're gonna go for it. Just they have like that wild streak, and it's that's positive, you know, when it when it's used positively, you know. And um, I yeah, we do forget about Australians. So in the going back into the book, I mean. Again, you're always telling these stories of people so we can grasp and understand what soldiers went through, what, be it male or female, right? A fighter pilot or, it, you know, just it don't matter. It, or a combat engineer. We get to understand what people went through during these wars and, and battles and, you know, how it's really a huge team effort, too. That's one thing we've got to think about is, like, it's a team um, effort, you know. Um, but... Dan Crowley is is a is a big part of your book. Tell everybody yes. about Dan. Okay, so I met Dan through a, a mutual friend who uh, is also a fellow author. And uh, you know, when she arranged the introduction, she said, "Mike, given all of the war stories that you write about, you really should talk to my friend Dan. He's been he's been a friend of mine for about forty years now, and uh, he was in." he was in the first infantry division back in the Vietnam war. And I said, okay, well, can you tell me more about what he's done? And she said, yeah, he was assigned to the first engineer battalion. And he's got a lot of incredible stories uh, to share about his time when he was over there. And he's in contact with many of his, uh, many of his fellow veterans. And I said, okay, well, yeah, I mean, that'd be great. I would love to, you know, I, I would love to hear him. I would love to hear him speak. I would love to meet him. And, uh, you know, he, of course, introduced me to uh, the rest of his veterans and uh, just an incredible story that Dan Crowley has to uh, tell in and of himself. You know, here was a uh, man who was a product of the greatest generation. You know, he was he was the uh, he was the first set of the baby boomers who were born to the men who were, were returning from World War Two. And, uh, you know, he very much grew up as a uh, product uh, of the 1950s and the early 60s where you know it was where nobody's patriotism was questioned and you know every war that America uh had fought in was a just war and uh it was your patriotic duty to serve in some form or fashion well Dan himself had a pretty itinerant childhood he would often go between Michigan and Florida and uh you know his parents owned uh owned a a very large resort property that, uh, you know, had a lot of wooded areas, had a lot of pastoral areas, which really cultivated his love for the outdoors. He also, uh, grew up with a, uh, with, I think, a very intimate knowledge of farm equipment, you know, uh, John Deere combines and tractors and how to maintain the uh, pastoral land that his parents owned. And, uh, you know, just aside from that, he also had a, uh, what started off as a, uh, as a, as a juvenile interest that I will say bordered on slight pyromania, but he was really into fireworks. Matter of fact, he was a, uh, he was a young pyrotechnic entrepreneur hmm. at a young grade school age where, you know, he would buy and sell fireworks and he would also, uh, you know, he, he would also make his own. <laughs> and, uh, he would also, uh, he would also say that, you know, his love of, uh, pyrotechnics would also 
uh, would also propagate some innovative ways to uh, to keep his family fed because he found out very quickly that he could take a uh, small stick of uh, small stick of dynamite and he could throw it into the local river where a lot of the walleye fish were running deep. And, you know, he would just count down, you know, five, four, three, two, one, and then boom, that part of the river would explode, but it would send up all the wall, all the walleye fish sky high and they would land on the bank and he'd be like, all right, score. I got enough uh, fish to feed my family for a week. <laughs> wow. So he, so he, he liked blowing stuff up. No, he did. <laughs> you know? And, yeah. and, you know, Hey, might as well, if you're going to have, you know, fish, let's get on with it. Yeah, exactly. Instead of waiting 10 years. So he, he was proactive. You yeah, know? So. He, he sure was. So, so right after high school, uh, you know, he, uh, that, that w- was when he decided to enlist in the army and he said, you know, uh, I'd gotten my, I'd gotten my draft notice, my notice that I was eligible for the draft, uh, when I turned 18. And being that, uh, being that everyone at that point in time was subject to a two year peacetime conscription, I figured, well, you know what? Let me join voluntarily so I have a choice of what I do and I can parlay some of the skills I pick up in the military to any number of, any number of career options I have later. So he decided to become a combat engineer and went through basic training. He went through his, uh, you know, he went through his, um, MOS training as a combat engineer. Uh, of course, gravitated more towards the pyrotechnic side of the house and he learned how to be a demolitions expert. So as a young private, barely 20 years old, or actually he's, st- he's uh, still 19 at this point, uh, he does a, he does a short tour of duty in West Germany. And he also volunteers for duty in Vietnam. So he, uh, you know, he says, Hey, this is a, uh, this is a great real world, real world mission. Uh, the war is still very young at this point. I think the, uh, the true combat mission, quote unquote, is barely a few months old. And he's just, uh, he's just ready and raring to get into a place where he can, uh, fight for freedom along the frontier of democracy in South Vietnam. So he gets his orders to, uh, he gets his orders to the first engineer battalion, a uh, unit that he has up until this point never heard of, part of the first infantry division. And he says, well, hey, great. You know what? By the time I get there, they're already going to be in Vietnam. So I'll be able to join my unit in country, uh, redeploys from Germany back to the U.S., goes from, uh, goes from the continental U.S. to San Francisco. And, uh, he boards a, uh, he boards a troop ship there. Almost doesn't make it because through a uh, comedy of errors, he lands in, uh, he lands in the Oakland Navy brig, uh, on, on, on Christmas, no less, on, on, on Christmas Eve, 1965. Wow. Uh, because, uh, one of the, one of the Marine MPs who was patrolling the area, uh, sees him in a bar and, uh, pegs him as being too young, quote unquote, to be in a bar <laughs> at the age of 19, even though Crowley was stone cold sober. Oh yeah, but uh, but because the uh, but because of the manpower needs in Vietnam, his transgression is uh, pretty much let off with a slap on the wrist, and he's put on the troop ship to to join his unit in country. Well, well, well by the time he gets there, the uh, first engineer battalion has been uh, on the ground in Vietnam for about four months at this point, and he's coming in as an individual replacement, and he's trying to learn the culture, trying to learn the uh, trying to learn the lay of the land and how to fight and to come out alive. And it's a, uh, it really is a baptism by fire that Crowley has for his entire year in Vietnam because from the outset, he is put in charge. He is put in, uh, he, he, he's put in charge of a number of demolitions. He's given a uh, whole equipment list, a whole kit bag of all these tools and pyrotechnics that are designed to do one thing, kill the enemy, kill them fast. And, create a whole lot of damage within a, a very wide radius of where his uh, of where his bombs go off. And he's going out on all of these demolition teams. At first he's marching right alongside the infantry and uh you know he's he's blowing up enemy ordnance that they find. He's uh you know he's blowing out and he's clearing these uh these wow. Viet Cong tunnels. And uh that's when he gets his first realization of just how resilient the Viet Cong are at this point and he uh, marvels at a lot of their uh, a lot of their engineering know-how now of course a lot of these tunnels have pre-existed before the Viet Cong did but uh, you know he says just seeing how they uh, seen how they mocked everything up and seeing how they uh, 
how they uh how they structured these tunnels and how how they laid them out so it was uh it was impressive and it was kind of scary at the same time and not only that learning how to adapt adapt to the adality to the uh realities of fighting in a jungle fighting in, in a guerrilla war says it was uh it was a very steep learning curve because you often didn't know who was a Viet Cong and who wasn't. This was an enemy that lurked in and amongst the population. Mm. And sometimes you didn't know if any of these, uh, any of these call girls who would come up and solicit a good time with any, any of these GIs was actually a Viet Cong spy. And you had to uh, be careful of who you associated with in and amongst the, uh, Saigon population because you didn't know if, uh, somebody who pretends to be your friend one day could turn out to be a Viet Cong mm. informant. Wow. So, because they were working all sides, right? It, it's yeah. kind of, yeah, that's kind of crazy because it, I think that's where the general public, like American general public, mm-hmm. didn't quite understand what was happening. You know, you mentioned how when soldiers and veterans came home that, you know, people were calling them baby killers. Right. And I don't, you know, yeah, there was issues, right? I think it was a war that actually you know from what i've read you know and is it it could drive you up the wall like literally you're yeah. out fighting in this heat um you know the bugs the you know and you one minute you think you have a friend like you're saying and then they're not and you when you get hurt or trapped you're you're hurt you're in you know you're in a jungle and it's crazy and at the same time it's like i i don't you don't know who to trust. Exactly. And so I think that's what, when things happened, villages uh, and women and children were hurt along the way. You know, that happens in every war, you know, regardless, it, it does. I mean, look what just happens, you know, with Hamas, right? Mm-hmm. You know, with hostages and, and all of that. Um, as much as, you know, there's the international thing of, you know, protect the women and children. That's not what happens really Mm -hmm. at the end of the day Mm -hmm. um so do you think that's part of it with the with the baby killers is that you know people would trust people and find out they can't and um you know then start to realize that you think that everyone's the enemy when maybe they were you know what i mean where you just kind of like you, you you can kind of freak out not knowing who's around you and um exactly yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's uh, that's one of the things that they wrestle with a lot is, you know, just not knowing exactly where the enemy is going to be on any given day and uh, also just fighting the hours of boredom. You know, uh, two of the two of the veterans, I think, outline this very well throughout the course of the project. Uh, both Dan Crowley and Chuck Humphrey commented on this in some form or fashion. But, you know, you have a, a tour of duty in Vietnam that can be best described as hours and hours of boredom interspersed by moments of sheer terror uh, because that was any number that was any number of the ambush patrols that they went on where they would uh, lay in wait they would set these claymore mines they would set these explosives they would set uh, all of these booby traps for a Viet Cong patrol and they could go out every day for a week and every night that particular week no enemy would come into their sector and then you know Two days later, they set an ambush patrol and, you know, they get like three enemy patrols that they ambush within the span of one night. (laughs) So it really was a hit or miss affair. And uh, not only that, they said that on any number of these convoys that we went on, some of the convoys, uh, you know, you had the uh, it seemed like the primary mission of the convoy was to just draw fire from the enemy and to see if you could smoke them out. I mean, of course, you know, the convoy had a destination, but, you know, the secondary mission that no one would talk about would be, okay, well, let's see how many uh, IEDs that we can run into today and uh, see if we can draw fire from the enemy. And, you know, if we can, if we can uncover another cachet, then we'll consider that uh, another step closer to victory. And uh, yeah. Larry Blair, the, the, the company commander, he commented on that as much because you would have a uh, patrol that would hit a landmine. And he and he said, you know, the irony is, is that uh, IEDs were something that were around long before the war in Iraq and Afghanistan ever started. You know, the, the Viet Cong had it pretty much had the IED 
the whole IED concept down to an art. And they would set up these command wire detonated devices in the middle of the road. And, uh, they would, they would specifically wow. position them to where they would fall underneath where a vehicle would be the most vulnerable and they would time it to detonate it where the softest part of the vehicle would be. And they said, you know, some, sometimes the, uh, sometimes the mines would work. Sometimes they wouldn't, but, uh, you know, you would, you would, you would dig these things up and you could follow the command wire back to the position where the bomber had been. And usually by that time he had split the scene, but you were able to gather up, you know, some Intel that would lead you closer to wherever the local VC cell was. Wow. So the engineers were like the ground warriors pretty much. Yeah. 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 They really were. Wow. So, and that's what I was saying. We, we just don't always hear about them, mm-hmm. you know, and how much, I mean, they put their life on the line because yeah, back then it's not like we had like a, a button on a cell phone to blow stuff up. Right. <laughs> You know, it's, 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 you know, everything was wired. And yeah. what about um backup supplies for the engineers? Was yeah. that an issue for them? Well, it, uh, it was simply because of where we were in the timeline uh, when, you know, the war was, uh, when the war was new and uh, we were trying to get troops in the theater as quickly as we could, there was often a, uh, there was often a backlog of supplies where you needed C4, you needed to clear more mines, and it wasn't always that easy to get them, especially when you needed them. But, uh, you know, the uh, the dirty little secret that everybody knows but nobody really discusses is what we call the supply chain mafia. And uh, that is if you know the right people and uh, you uh, have connections to any one of those network of supply depots that are in-country, you can uh, use those connections to get what we call priority access to uh, any one of the any one of the gear items or any one of the essential items that you need. And of course, uh, you know it's uh, it's also it's also a well known fact that uh, things are, as they say, quote unquote, tactically acquired. You know, like uh, oh, oh, this particular depot here was left unattended. Well, you know, I mean, I'm a soldier and I certainly need this piece of gear. I don't think anyone's going to miss it if I just five finger this little piece of C4 right here and take it with me on a mission. And, uh, but then you, of course, you know, you leave, uh, you leave that particular, uh, you leave that particular supply unit short in the books on uh, C4 that they can't account for. <laughs> wow. Wow. So that's, that's things that people need to know, yes. you know, the general public. What else do you think when you were doing this investigation, like the investigate, the research, you know, but I feel like you're an investigator, you know, when you're going through this, did you find anything that, you know, kind of raised your eyebrows that um, maybe we just haven't been told in history books and in media and, you know, um, obviously the movies do what they want to do, right? Right. They paint their brush the way they want to paint it. Yeah. But did you did you come across things that you're like, you know, because you're a, a teacher, you know, you're, you're a historian. Um, but did you find something that went, oh, man, I didn't know that, you know, this is what they were going through? Yeah, well, there were there were a few things that really, really jumped out to me. One of them was the fact that uh, very often the local bazaars in Saigon could get uh, top quality supplies at uh, cheaper prices than they could get from their own supply depots. Uh, that really struck me as interesting. And, uh, you know, also uh, something that uh, struck me as peculiar was that a lot of these local bazaars would have wow. World War II vintage equipment uh for sale at bargain basement prices and uh you know the uh uh the regulations at the time didn't prohibit soldiers from buying you know these second hand older generation weapons and actually taking them out on missions it's like okay no well, way it's like really? yeah like, oh of course yeah so you know you'd have a soldier with his uh m16 assault rifle or the uh, few units that were still using the m14 at that time well if he goes to one of the local street vendors in saigon and, uh, you know, is able to, uh, is able to get like a, a World War II era, uh, uh, Thompson submachine gun for only like $2 and 50 cents, you know, plus he can buy like a whole month's worth of ammo for that gun for only 10 bucks. It'd be like, yeah, hey man, that's a great deal. I'll buy this, I'll buy this old GI machine gun. I'll take it with me. And, uh, yeah, it'll be one more thing that I have to kill the enemy with. So that was, uh, that was a very pleasant surprise that I uncovered because, uh, yeah, just thinking, 
you know, um, based on my own experiences in the military, it's like if the weapon or the piece of uh, equipment was not issued, if it was not, if it was not per the AR 670 one regulations, they're like, no soldier, you, you get rid of that. You can't have it. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. So that was one thing. And another thing really that, uh, that struck me just, uh, as it, it struck me as interesting, really just in its anecdotal form was just a lot of the, a lot of the war stories that both Dan Crowley and Larry Blair had to share, particularly of, uh, of moments where, you you just have to you just have to think to yourself you know truth really is a lot stranger than fiction sometimes because there was the uh, there was the episode that Dan Crowley told me about of uh where he was in placing a minefield and uh you had this uh you had this one wacko GI who uh you know who despite the fact that it was very clear that there was a minefield being laid in front of this guy tried to navigate his way through it you know, the whole setup of the story is that, um, they had, uh, they had cleared this one section that was adjacent to one of the base camps and they were setting a minefield around it as a protective measure. Well, Dan Crowley, as, uh, as one of the demolitions experts, he was working with the battalion executive officer to try to set this land minefield, or excuse me, to set this minefield in place. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they had, they had fenced it off with barbed wire. They had put warning signs all around it. And uh, then out of nowhere, this one random GI who was, was also assigned to Dan's unit comes into view and Dan sees him out of the corner of his eye. And he's thinking to himself, how the hell did this fella get in here to get to where he is now? He would have had to have shimmy through like four different strands of barbed wire and he's emerged unscathed. You know, but this uh, this one GI is not only smoking a cigarette, he's got a transistor radio on the other hand. And he's just, and he's just gingerly going along, you know, like he doesn't have a care in the world. So, uh, Dan, he yells out to him, Hey, stop, fellow. This is a minefield. You're going to have to go around the other way, you know, and, uh, and the GI just like stops in his tracks for a moment and, uh, is, I, I guess, you know, tries to contemplate the situation. And for one reason or another, he just gets the wild idea to take off running and, Hey, I think I'm just going to run my way through this minefield and, uh, you know, See if I can John Wayne the whole thing. Well, wow. <laughs> well, seriously. Well, yeah. Well, Murphy's Law being what it is, this guy, you know, of course, steps on a landmine. And, uh, you know, the landmines are still clearly being marked at this point. You know, there's a stake that's by almost each and every one of them. And uh, he steps on a landmine and the landmine just happens to be a few feet away from where Dan Crowley is. So the landmine blows the foot off the poor G.I., and the blast or the, or the shockwave of the blast is enough to send Dan Crowley into a somersault. Wow. Dan lands with barely enough consciousness left, but by the, by the time he regains his senses, somehow having, despite taking a somersault, Dan still has the detonator device in his hand. But, you know, he gets up, he has this intense ringing in his ears. You know, of course, he's he's just, you know, he's just been, uh, he's just been way too close to a blast. But he sees the GI who uh, is not only missing his foot, but despite the fact that he's not missing, or despite the fact that he's missing his foot, he's still crawling across the minefield to try to get to the cigarette that he dropped when the blast blew his foot off. What the and hell? Dan, Are and you Dan's thinking? Dude. Yeah, and Dan's thinking to himself, "Oh my God, Bella, you just tried to run across a minefield. You know, you just had your foot literally blown off. It's been severed off of your body, and you're trying to save your cigarette for a few more puffs before it gets down to the butt. What the hell is wrong with this guy?" You know, so, yeah. yeah, so, um, so, uh, Dan said that that one episode is the thing that haunts him the most out of his time in Vietnam. He says, because I still can't figure it out. What was this? Yeah, I wonder problem? if he had malaria. It, like, yeah, I mean, I was wondering if it was, you know, whether it was like some undiagnosed mental condition. Was this guy just a section eight that was waiting to happen? Or, you yeah. know, was he, you know, was he, was he trying to commit suicide? Was it, you know, was it some kind of other disorder that was just scrambling his brain? I but, think, I yeah. think when you're in so much heat and humidity yeah. and you don't know who to trust and it, yeah, I think it can just get to you. I, I really I, think it can. Yeah. You know? So, so uh, yeah. So Dan, Dan lost his hearing, I think for the better part of a day and, you know, his, his hearing eventually oh. returned, but uh, yeah, he said, even to this day, that episode still gives him nightmares and I, I can't blame him. I really can't. I wonder about, you know, um, 
hearing yeah. for those who have been to war, you know, yeah. because even just cannons, like I've filmed like cannons being shot mm-hmm. often, no matter what I do, I'm like, I jump and I don't care if I've got a tripod or not, man, uh-uh. <laughs> it's like I'm going down. I don't care yeah. if you're putting earbuds in or not. I mean, that sound, it, it's loud. It I is. Mean, it, it really is. is loud. Yeah. And, I mean, I, uh, I, I mean, even from my own experiences as a tank commander, it, uh, you know, and even with the ear protection we have built in to our CVC covers. Yeah. When, uh, when you hear that gun go off, I mean, it, it is, it is loud as all get out. And, uh, what, uh, what really shocks you more than the uh, sound of the gun going off is the shock wave itself, uh, of the blast. Mm-hmm. Cause, you know, if you're, if you're even within a good 20 meters of a tank, when that main gun fires, oh man, the concussion wave, that will, that will knock you right to your feet. It really will. You, you could, well, things like that go through your body and that also creates yeah. your body to make sound, your blood. Right. And everything moving. Adrenaline makes a sound. You know, that's, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think eventually, like for some people, it can, that's where I say that guy could have, you know, something could have just ticked him at that point, you know, but that is crazy. You know, like just for a cigarette, you know, maybe yeah. he was scared. He was like, I'm going down. So I need to smoke, you know, or maybe he had maybe. more things in, in that cigarette than we know. Could you know? be. Could <laughs> be. Yeah. Like, Dude, if I'm going down with my foot, I'm going to be happy. You know? yeah, who exactly. knows? Who knows what was going on there? And and what about drugs? You know, that's where everybody is talking about, you know, that, um, you know, guys out there fighting were on, were high. Right. A lot. Do you think you, what about well, that? Did you come across anything on on that when you were re- researching this? Well, no, I um I, I didn't hear any stories explicitly from Dan or from any of the other veterans about any of the experimental drugs that were circulating around Vietnam. I mean, I know that they were at the time, and I know that uh, you know I know that uh, I know that marijuana was very prevalent at the time, and uh, in a lot of places in the military, it actually still is. But, uh, but the one, uh, the one drug I know, and I'm just speaking in generalities when I say this, is that I know that the one drug, uh, that caused, um, caused irreparable damage for a lot of soldiers in Vietnam was LSD. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it wasn't like alcohol or it wasn't like marijuana. Because if you, you know, if you drink alcohol, you get drunk, your faculties mm-hmm. will re- return when you sober up. And, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if, if you're token the reefer, same difference. Whenever you come off of your high, that's when your, that's when your faculties return. But, uh, but taking an acid trip, you know, if, mm-hmm. if you were dropping LSD, that's going to alter the neurophysiology of the brain. And, you know, you could be stone cold sober for three years afterwards, not even touch the stuff. And then, uh, at random boom, you sail out on another, on mm-hmm. another acid trip. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that was a big thing for, uh, uh, soldiers who were, you know, who were in Vietnam at the time, uh, you know, LSD and, you know, but it, it's kind of ironic that, uh, you know, if it wasn't the illicit drugs that were harming their health long term, it was Agent Orange, which was a, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, which was the defoliant that we were using. Yeah. yeah Agent Orange is, is terrible. And, um, I interviewed, a lady, uh, Rita Kopolinsky and, um, mm-hmm. She's passed since, and um, it was about Agent Orange, and her husband went to war to Vietnam, and she they had married right before, and um, he came back and had, you know, been affected by Agent Orange, but it didn't really get him, and it actually affected her um, and her child, mm. so it went from him to the child, and so the child was born had all kinds of issues, uh, autism, you name it. And um, then it went down to the next child. So it's kind of this weird thing how it does these just generational yep. changes. And um, she went to Congress. She did so much. And <clears throat> and and also got to that point, I think, where where there's like a paranoia that can happen when your family is affected by something so traumatic as that that's not a paranoia but like a you're you're obsessed with it you know your your passion can turn to obsessiveness you know what i mean we cannot let something go because it's that unjust and and it was that terrible um, which i understand but like she um 
I remember interviewing her and she's like, are you near a railroad? I'm like, yeah, actually, there's a railroad down the street. She's like, you need to get away. People should not because Agent Orange has been, you know, carried by railroad by certain things. She's like, people should not live in these places because it splashes over and you'll get it. Yeah. And she is, she really thought it held, uh, created a lot of the autoimmune issues that we have now because of the environmental effects. And then you've got to think about how it was tested in Hawaii. Um, it, I mean, they sprayed it over Hawaii as testing grounds. We've done shows on it and um, all kinds of things where, you know, it's not, it wasn't popular to do when we did. And right. um, that stayed in the ground. And we have a friend who did uh, soil tests with scientists, but it, not just, hey, I'm out there with my eye microscope, like real deal stuff. And um, how it did actually affect the water table. It affected agriculture. And all of this happens um, all around the school. And then it went into um, agriculture that's not too happy, too, because it's all owned by the same company. Yeah. Very crazy story. But, yeah, it's still there. And they, you know, Agent Orange is still around in different forms. And um, it's a scary thing. And I think it's still in. I, we have a lot of you know, families with a lot of medical issues that are still kind of unknown. And I'm wondering about that generational skip and how it goes through kids, you know, mm -hmm. maybe not the people that were right there, but how it does that to what, what are the effects that we're feeling now in society that we don't realize goes back to Agent Orange. Yeah. You know, you know I'm not trying to be like a, an alarmist or, you know, a conspiracy theory or anything like that. I, I think it's a genuine thing mm -hmm. that, um, we have going and um but yeah she she um wrote a book about it and it was it was crazy uh, when you start really reading and what her husband how her husband's personality completely changed when he came home yeah and um you know and she and they were totally in love and happy and not afterwards mm -hmm. it was very difficult and um especially with a child back in those days so she was almost like a single parent in a way um but um, and and her husband passed early, I think, too, as I recall, because of it. Um, but it did it didn't affect her, which is interesting. But it affected her child. Yeah. How it went through that. Um, so yeah, th there's so much about what everyone went through in Vietnam and with the drugs. I think that was just the culture at the time, and people didn't realize how bad it was for you at that point. Not right. yet. I mean, we had the reefer madness thing, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, look at it. It's, it's legal now. Weed is just not as big a deal as people. Well, it depends on what you're doing, right? I'm not, I don't want to, you know, push anybody into drugs or anything. It's not my call. But it's, I think at that time, it's like cigarettes weren't a big deal, you know, back in the day. And now we realize how bad it is for our health. Um, but I kind of deep down think, don't we all know when you're doing something like that to your body, that you can feel it? Don't you think deep down? You know? Yeah. Maybe you do. Um, but if yeah, it's a I think there's. Well, I, I think, I think, the, the biggest thing that you feel at the time is a sense of relief and a, a high that wasn't there before. You know, I mean, people talk about natural highs. Well, yeah, you know, if you take like that biggest natural high and you uh, try to replicate it in a chemical sense. You know, you just want that good feeling. You want that feeling of euphoria. It's either that or you want something that's going to dull the pain that you're feeling at any given time. And, you know, I think in a broader sense, that's why a lot of people turn to alcohol. And, you know, you have all those songs that say, oh, you know, this bottle is my only friend. And I find mm -hmm. happiness at the bottom of a glass of Jack Daniels or whatever. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's that, uh, I, I guess I want to call it a, uh, a, a, a neurodepressant or even a neurostimulant, something that, uh, like a numbing agent, because like, yes, you yes, think exactly. about it, it being out there in the jungle and all this stuff is happening, right? It's crazy. Yeah. And you're like, there's fear, no matter what. I don't care who you are. There's a little that there's fear in there. You know, yeah. it's, it's a good thing and it's a, can be a bad thing. But, um, so LSD could just heighten what's going on like and and make you trip out bad so now i wonder about that guy if you you know 
but then he would he be able to go and pick up his cigarette again and so that's a that's just that's a wild story mike yes that's crazy yeah. like i dude no way i mean <laughs> just even going over the land like you know just growing up and learning about limpet mines and things like you know that was a real deal in africa about you know mines Mm-hmm. And in this country, like, you know, it was so weird to come here and come home and people didn't know what the heck we were talking about, except for military people. <laughs> we get right. along with military people. They understand. Like, we're like, okay, you know, you have to be careful where you could go walking out anywhere in, in Africa and you could blow up and you, you know, it's just a mine that was there or, you know, um, but I mean, in Asia, they still have mines out there, right? In like Cambodia mm. and stuff, right? They still oh, yeah. are detonating these mines. And yeah, yeah they're still oh, down in Afghanistan. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Oh. A lot of, uh, yeah, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of mines, uh, oddly enough, uh, a lot of minefields from what I understand from, uh, you know, from back, uh, back in the days of the Soviet war. Really? So you yeah. never know if they could just detonate or do you think they just die off over age? Oh, well, that's the thing. Um, there's always, uh, you know, there's always the uh, chance that, that that the uh, there's always a chance that the detonation um, uh, that the de- that the detonator mechanism is always going to stay intact. Um, you know, it's been, uh, you know, they they have uh, found and forced detonated mines that have been upwards of fifty years old. So, mm. yeah. growing up too, we also learned about hand grenades. Yeah, and those are scary, scary, scary things to me. Hand grenades. Mm-hmm. Um, and that they were around in World Wars too, right? World War Two, World War One, World War Two, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So in Vietnam as well, right? Hand oh, grenades, course. like, oh my gosh, like, are we still using them now? I know, and oh, you yeah. know, that was something. Yep, no yep, way, in hell. like that. That would be, you know, I have a hard time putting on, you know, house alarms, <laughs> you know, turning them on and off. That would scare the, you know, what out of me mm-hmm. to hold that. I mean, even, you know what I mean? To go through even that training of knowing that you have to pull this and throw it and not do it at the wrong time or like, could they just blow you up out of like suddenly something, you know, it got too hot. You know, the M&Ms don't melt, but your, you know, your hand grenade's going to blow up. You know, could it just out of like a malfunction just blow up on you? Well, not as long as you have the safety pin inside. Um, Once you pull the pin... Yeah. Once you pull the pin from the grenade, uh, now the grenade, uh, you can still keep it from going off as long as you keep your hand on the clip. As, as long as you keep your hand fully, as long as you keep your hand fully depressed on top of the clip itself, if you, uh, if you pull the pin, but your hand is still on the clip, the grenade won't go off. Um, you know, it's usually, uh, you have about, uh, about five to seven seconds, um, after, you uh after you after you let go of the clip then that what and then that's what's going to arm the mechanism for it to explode and uh and uh yeah but once you once you take your hand off the clip that's it you know but okay so like you know i throw balls for dogs right and biscuits and stuff and um, I get laughed at quite a bit and the dogs often look at me like, what the hell was that? Like, that was not a good throw, That that sucked. Why is it on the roof in the gutter? Why is a dog biscuit under the chair? Like, <laughs> why didn't you do that? So like, you better be a good thrower, right? <laughs> to be, to, like, you gotta be a pitcher to do this, you know, to be able to throw a hand grenade. I mean, well, well, you don't, kind you don't of. want to drop it, right? Yeah. Like, holy yeah. cow. Yeah, so you know, th- th- there's a whole block of instruction that um, that every soldier goes through in basic training, uh, where you have to uh, where you have to learn the fundamentals of how to employ hand grenades. There's a there's actually a hand grenade assault course where they teach you the proper employment. You know, they teach you how to properly keep it stored on your person, and uh, then when you use the hand grenade, there's a certain technique that you have to use in order to throw it. They they show you this technique. It's comparable to throwing a baseball, kind of. Yeah. But they but they, they show you the mechanics of it to try to get the most range um, for the uh, for, for for the grenade. And there's even a jingle that I remember that they teach you whenever you're about to use it. And it's a it's a jingle for a three part process. They say first thumb the clip, or uh, yeah, they say. Um, let's see. It's uh, oh no, I'm sorry. It is proper grip. Thumb the clip, 
twist, pull the pin, and throw. Wow. So you get to remember that, and you better. Now, yeah. what about the combat engineers? I would would you think that were 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 hand grenades used quite a bit because oh, of course you know they're on the ground, and that would be something that sometimes it might be quicker to grab than a than a gun or a rifle. Well, or? Um, it, it I wouldn't say that it would be quicker to grab, um, but it would just be it would be a good tool to use if ever you feel like you're pinned down or if you want to try to facilitate a better advance towards something. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, like so you could de- you could like toss a grenade, let it blow up over there, so they think you're there, and then run the other way. Kind of thing. You could do that. You could do that, or you could throw the grenade to say theoretically a squad of enemy troops and then that grenade blast will probably kill any three soldiers that are within a 20 meter radius of it and then uh, as you know and anybody beyond that 20 meter radius is going to have a bad concussion and ringing in their ears and you can use that tactical delay to move to move forward to another forward covered position and maybe lay down fire or you know facilitate uh, facilitate killing of that entire enemy squad I I just think the combat engineer thing is is you know hardcore. Like if you're building bridges and stuff like that, like yeah. I mean, it's it's because you know that a lot of times you're going to be in like in some kind of valley. Do you, it kind of feels like cowboys and Indians. You know what I mean? Right. Like they're going to sure does gonna like bounce you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and they know their terrain better than our soldiers would ever know. And you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. that had to be like just really like you're always looking out the back of your head exactly for people so i mean because we didn't have all the technology we have now did we would you say we had better training and technology than after world war ii like we were better prepared in some ways because oh yeah yeah you know what uh the the training that we had at the time and the technology we had at the time was much better than where we were in December of 1941. I mean, yeah, there was, there was more of a reliance on strategic retaliation by the late 1950s and early 60s. So, I mean, you, uh, you had more of the defense dollars allocated towards, you know, like strategic, strategic missiles and NORAD and whatnot. Um, but, you know, the, uh, the training at the soldier level and the, uh, you know, the tactical competence of our troops, was still head and shoulders above uh, where we were or when we started out at the beginning of World War II. And, you you know, you see that played out time and again in uh, so many of those opening battles of Vietnam, you know, where where, uh, where where we were just mopping up the Viet Cong left and right. You know, I mean, people forget that uh, that we won every single ground battle in Vietnam and yeah. uh, we killed over two million North Vietnamese. And we 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 won the war and we had even won the peace at first, but we ended up throwing South Vietnam to the wolves when the North Vietnamese, you know, invaded in, uh, in, in 75. Mm. Good memory for people to, yeah. to have a good reminder, not a memory, but a good reminder, right. you know, of what happened, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I know it's crazy. And I think like Jane Fonda, really pissed people off you know people you know i I think she apologized later about that um but it was it kind of like once every what a wild time to be alive right Right. you know people and you know fighting and then at the same time it was the hippie time i mean it was just this whole um yeah i would i'd put the word yeah it's a little crazy you know a Mm -hmm. very mixed bag of, of the world but it was a good era for music. No, oh, yeah, I think. yeah, it sure was. That, that was a good era for music, yeah. you know. No um, arguments and there. Heli- what, I know helicopters were, you know, used in World War II, but do you think this was like the era of the helicopter? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this really was the uh, first conflict where helicopters really came into their own. You know, I mean, helicopter warfare is what it is today, I think, largely in part of uh, what we did and what we learned from Vietnam. And Hal Moore. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Got to bring him back into that. Yeah. Well, you know, Mike, again, congratulations on the... How many books now, before I get it wrong? It's in the uh, 20s. Yes, uh, this this actually makes 26 now. Oh, 
Now, I, obviously, I can't keep up or count, but, you know, 26, that is awesome. That is awesome. What's coming um, up in 2024? All right. In, in uh, 2024, two books. Uh, one is Red Bandit, the Combat History of the MiG-29, mm-hmm. and another one called Sarajevo at Dawn. And that is about the spy war in in Bosnia back in the wow. mid-90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a little close to home, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's. I feel like everything's cycling. <laughs> you know, these cycles keep spinning around, right. and we're right back to where we were. You know, mm-hmm. and I, I wonder about that. If veterans sit back and go, "Dude, we already fixed this, and now we're doing it again." You know, it's like it's like you know policies. You know, you mm-hmm. fight for something, it becomes a law, and then it gets taken away, and it's like that's the way it is. It's it's interesting what happens in the world. It's the humans. Humans do things. Um, everyone, MikeGuardia.com is a website to keep up with Mike, but I encourage you to go to Amazon. Uh, go to Mike's page on Amazon. That's where you can pre-order uh, it, it, his new book and get his other books. Great holiday gifts. Uh, you, the book is Fire in the Hole, Tales of Combat with the 1st Engineer Battalion in Vietnam. And uh, that, again, you can pre-order it December 7th on Kindle. And people can gift Kindle copies, right? Of course. Yeah. 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 Just saying, if you didn't get that shipping, you got a shipping problem. This is a good thing. Yeah. Um, and Kindle and paperback versions will be out December 15th. So in time for the holidays. So check that out. Go to his Amazon page there and also MikeGuardia.com. Mike, we're looking forward to the new year with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Always a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you for listening to Big Blend Radio's Military Monday show featuring Mike Guardia, award-winning author and historian. Keep up with Mike and his books at mikeguardia.com. Follow us at bigblendradio.com.